Environmental Changes and Organisms. Today we're going to explore how short-term and long-term environmental changes affect organisms and traits in subsequent populations. Starter. The giant salvina is an aquatic plant that floats on water and reproduces rapidly. When these plants die, decomposition by bacteria affects oxygen levels in the water. As more plants die, less oxygen is available in the water. Students observe a pond covered by giant salvina. Which statement is the best prediction the students can make about the immediate future of the pond? So here is a picture of that salvia floating on the pond. So letter A, the depth of the water in the pond will increase. Fish populations in the pond will begin to decrease. The amount of bacteria in the pond will suddenly decrease. The number of different types of plants found in the pond will increase. So here, uh, what you're going to see are fish populations in the pond will begin to decrease because up here, the oxygen levels in the water will be affected. So there's less oxygen available in the water for the fish. Let's read the teak below. We're going to be exploring how short and long-term environmental changes affect organisms and traits in subsequent populations. So what can affect organisms' traits and future populations? It's going to be those short and long-term environmental changes. So we're going to look at those today. So for short-term environmental changes, these are changes that occur quickly in an ecosystem and affect organisms immediately. It doesn't give organisms time to adapt to changes. It forces populations to move or possibly become extinct. So some examples with that, of that would be a drought where there's no water, flood where there's immediate water, and forest fires. Drought. Drought is a severe lack of rainfall in an area over a certain time period. Floods. Floods, you have days of heavy rainfall that cause rivers to rise over their banks. Wildfires. Large, destructive fire that spreads quickly over the woodland or brush. Now we're going to look at long-term environmental changes. These changes occur slowly over time and affect organisms over several generations. Gradual changes that allow organisms time to adapt. Organisms become better adapted to survive in their environment. So that could be climate fluctuations like global warming, deforestation, and pollution. So climate fluctuations is a change in global or regional climate patterns. Deforestation, the result of cutting down or clearing all the trees in an area. Pollution, the contamination of air, water, or soil by substances that are harmful to living organisms. Okay, so we're going to look at some case studies on floods and toxic spills. We're going to click on the name of the environmental change to watch a short video to help fill out the data tables. So let's have a look at floods. Well, the recent floods have been devastating for a lot of Oklahomans, but it's also had an impact on wildlife. So Dwayne, how, how does flooding impact wildlife? So it can be positive or negative depending on the animal we're talking about. Some things like frogs have had a good year because wetlands have stayed full, lots of habitat for them to breed. Um, other animals like ground nesting birds have really had a tough year, a lot of nests have been lost. So you can expect things like wild turkey to really decline for next year. People have probably noticed all the dead turtles on the road. They're moving a lot, trying to take advantage of new wetlands that uh, have been filled this spring. Um, so just slow down and uh, you know avoid them. And uh, if you see one on a road that's not too busy, you might move it across the road, but mostly just watch out for them and try not to hit them. Lots of people are you know calling in with snakes in their in their yard or, or around their house. And 
uh, you know, a lot of wildlife has been displaced, so just try to be as tolerant as you can, and, and remember those snakes are helping control rodents, and they're important, and um, just, you know, let them be. In regard, and, uh, I guess a little bit more on that, uh, is, it, is it possible for, you know, uh, areas like in, you know, southeastern Oklahoma where uh, snakes like, venomous snakes like uh, cottonmouths uh, might be moving, you know, in areas that they wouldn't normally be? You, yeah, you might see snakes uh, like cottonmouth a little further from water than you're typically used to, but cottonmouths only occur in extreme eastern Oklahoma, and so most of the snakes that are reported are not venomous. They're just non-venomous water snakes. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that this, you know, with the flooding, they're finding animals that have been displaced that they wouldn't normally else see, but this is also the time of year that's not, you know, not specific to flooding, where people are finding... Uh, young animals that they probably should just leave alone. Yeah, so lots of calls are coming in now about people finding uh, deer fawns. So if you find uh, an animal, a young animal, just leave it alone. Uh, most likely the parent is nearby trying to feed that animal and the longer you disturb it, uh, you know, the, the worse off it is for that young animal. And so if, you know, if you if you're, have strong concern that that animal uh, ha has been orphaned, just call the wildlife department, but let the animal stay where it is. Don't, don't pick it up. All right, thanks, Wayne. If you would like some more information on wildlife and flooding, go to our website, setup.okstate.edu. Okay, so floods, short-term or long-term. Okay, so a flood is a short-term environmental change. And how does this change affect organisms? Well, lots of organisms can be displaced. Okay, they are not really found in the area that they're normally found. And remember, the best thing to do is to just leave them be. Okay, so let's have a look at toxic spills now. And uh, let's watch this short video. All right, well, it looks like a nice spider web over here. Let's see if we can catch this on film. Um, missed it up a little bit. You know what was invisible now becomes visible. Nice. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, yeah, this this one's sitting in, in, in being bathed in about 45 microsieverts per hour, plus or minus, which is pretty darn radioactive. <laughs> In 1986, an explosion and fire at a nuclear reactor in what was then the Soviet Union in Chernobyl, Ukraine, launched a plume of radioactive fallout that rendered a large swath of the region here uninhabitable. Since then, the creation of a thousand square mile exclusion zone prohibiting human activity has led some to declare the area a restored Eden, brimming with wildlife. <laughs> But for more than a decade, Timothy Mousseau, an American scientist, has conducted an extensive biological survey here, and his studies have shown that life has been far more slow to recover than previously believed. It's a perfect area for biological studies because we see a diversity of, of plants and animals. It's one of the hotter areas uh, in the Chernobyl zone. And so from our previous work, we know that this, this level of, of chronic exposure is above that that most species will tolerate. Okay. Uh, this year we've been looking at the small rodents, we've been looking at spiders. Earlier this year we were here working with the birds. We found that the abundance of many species of birds are depressed in these areas of high contamination, leading to an overall decrease in the biodiversity on the order of 50% you know, fewer species in hot areas than there should be uh, if, there, if there wasn't radioactivity in the area. Mousseau says he has seen much higher frequencies of tumors and physical abnormalities, like deformed beaks among birds, compared with those from uncontaminated areas. He has measured decline in populations of insects and spiders, and yet in a recent paper released last month, 
Rousseau has also shown that some birds here may actually be adapting to high radiation levels. So these are uh, special digital audio recorders that are designed to pick up the high frequency sounds that bats produce while they're echolocating and flying around and trying to capture insects. And by the frequency of calls, we can get an idea of the abundance of bats. Yeah, look at this mushroom there. Let's see if it goes up. Oh, look at that, eh? Uh, oh, 43. So 42, 43. So, yeah, this mushroom is definitely much hotter than the surrounding areas. The legacy of Chernobyl, Mousseau says, can be seen not just in animal life. Cut trees here show a dramatic change in the color of their rings, exactly in 1986. It occurred to us uh, after visiting Fukushima uh, last year that some of those spider webs looked a little strange. And, and, and so we thought we would test that hypothesis in a very scientific way by, by capturing images of as many spider webs as we, can, as we can find in hot and cold areas of the same kinds of species to see if there's more variability or you know, less, less, less structure to the webs in these radioactive areas. It could serve as a, as a biomarker of the background radiation. We're in the town of Chernobyl, uh, downtown Chernobyl as it were, and what we found is that the frequency of aberrant color patterns on the, on the backsides of these bugs is directly proportional to how radioactive the area is. The one on this side is relatively normal, and then you look on the other one, and you see that the black spots are kind of fused together. Thank you. Rousseau's work in Chernobyl will continue for years to come. He's extended his study to Fukushima, Japan, and hopes to shed a brighter light on the lasting effects of radiation on biological systems, including humans. Okay, so here we saw the toxic spill as a long-term environmental change and how much it's changed those organisms from plants to animals over time. Okay, so write to me here and if you'd like to re-watch the movie again, uh, you can do that as well. So, uh, for our exit today, the Arctic is an ice-covered area with blizzards, bitter cold, and long periods of darkness. Despite these extreme temperatures, there's a wide variety of wildlife, including plankton, fish, plants, birds, seals, walruses, whales, and polar bears. A recent change in the climate has led to a decrease in the amount of sea ice and an increase in ocean temperature. A 2013 study of the Arctic reported a significant decrease in the amount of fish in the Arctic Sea. Question, what effect would you expect the change in climate to have on a population of polar bears whose main diet consists of seals? So you see the seal's energy goes to the polar bear, but the fish energy also goes to the seal. So if you have a decline in seals, who eat the fish. Well, here it's saying you're going to have a decrease in fish, so the seals won't have um, the food source that they need, so the seal population will decrease, and that will, in effect, uh, limit the polar bear uh, as well, because the fish, at, uh, the polar bear at first could eat, you know, have the energy from the fish and the seal, but with a decline in fish, you're going to have an overall decline in the polar bear population.